find out what medications they are taking, whether they are on any anticoagulants, antithrombotics, or prothrombotics. A lot of people who have dysmenorrhea are on tranexamic acid. That's the mid young to middle age people. And find out whether they are taking things like warfarin and there are a whole host of new anticoagulants that they take orally, or whether they have been on post-surgery on a, a heparin infusion or something. See whether there is a family history. Most popular family history is the Cadacil, but there is Caracil, Febris disease, a lot of things that you learned in medical school. Found out whether they are smokers, because smokers have a higher risk of having strokes than the others. Uh, so I said anybody with sudden uh, focal loss of neurological function, we should be thinking of a stroke. What are the other things that can mimic strokes or the differential diagnosis you should be thinking when you're doing the Clarke? Fainting attacks or syncopal attacks. It's strictly not a stroke because it's generalized and not focal. But another thing is seizure with post -ictal. Nobody must have seen the patient having the seizure. They might come with uh, weakness, which is suggestive of a stroke. Migraine with aura. Usually there is a family history. There is a past history of migraine. But first time, it's very tricky. It could be metabolic causes like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia. Tumors in the brain, cerebral abscess are less likely. But if there is bleeding into a tumor, suddenly there can be sudden onset of neurology. Cerebral abscess, usually the patients are very ill. When you come to examination, uh, usually I have the ABCD approach to ensure that the patient is safe. Look at the airway especially if there is loss, uh, reduced level of consciousness, whether they are vomiting, whether there is vomitus in their way, if so, please clean. See whether there are saturation, breathing away, okay, whether the saturation is low. If low, put a, give some oxygen. Check the blood pressure, whether it's very high, very low. Check the heart rate and the rhythm. Do the neurological deficit level of consciousness, whether they are, you can do the GCS or you, whatever is come, you're familiar with. Examine the cranial nerves, look at the pupil size, response to light reflex, do the visual field. When I examine a patient's eyes, I do the visual field, visual attention, and eye movements at the same time. When you're doing the eye movements, see whether there is nystagmus, therefore you can save some time. Look for facial weakness. If there is facial asymmetry, try to see whether this is upper motor or low motor. I'm sure you have gone through this in your final years, and I'm not going to repeat it. Examine the power in the upper limbs. Look for sensory sensations. Look for sensory inattention at the same time. Look for cerebellar signs at the same time. We don't go into finer thing, uh, details. We generally look for, look for proximal and distal if you are looking for stroke. And uh, same with the lower limbs. And there is a new way of examining, which is from the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, which is NIH Stroke Scale. Usually, if you are working in a thrombolysis center, a, a, a hospital where strokes are thrombolyzed, that is the way they document, because this is easier to communicate with each other. Don't stop at examining the nervous system. You all are good internees, so go ahead and examine the rest. If you don't examine, you will not know the abnormalities. Listen to the chest. Has the patient already choked on their vomitus and caused bronchi, crepitations, abdomen? Is there a distended abdomen? Cardiovascular system, muscular system. Some of these people, like the example I said, if they are running to the bus and have a fall, there might be a cut or a bruise. Look at those, look for fractures and exclude those. Let's take an example of a 68-year-old male patient who was admitted with a sudden onset left-sided face arm leg weakness of two hours duration. So as a good internist, you should realize there is a sudden onset and the weakness is on one side. So the brain, it has to be a focal lesion and there's loss of function. This is neurological deficit. Is this a stroke? Strokes are very important during the acute stage 
for every minute we delay in management, they lose about a million neurons. So their disability worsens. So stroke is actually a medical emergency. When you went into the detailed history, you realize these additional part. He's a right-handed person. Uh, he's a teacher who generally cycles to work. He has hypertension, diabetes, and very compliant in his medications. Take losartan, metformin, and atavastatin. So it's still, he has risk factors, additional. He's a right-handed person, so we know his dominant brain is the left side of the brain and he's cycling, so we need to, those are his, his ADL independent. Going into examination, he's alert, GCS is 15 by 15, he's dysarthria. I hope you remember the difference between dysarthria and dysphasia. Dysarthria is where there is difficulty in articulation of words due to the low motor neuron facial nerve or upper motor neuron facial nerve palsy. Dysphasia is a problem in the brain visual fields, eye movements, and uh, are normal. There is upper motor neuron type, seventh nerve palsy. Upper limb power is zero out of five. Left lower limb power is zero out of five. No sensory signs, no cerebellar signs. Blood pressure is little well elevated, but chest examination, others are neurologically normal. So where is the stroke? Now I'm thinking of a stroke. This man is coming with left side body weight, body weakness. So the left side of the body is controlled by the right side of the brain. So he has should be having a lesion on the right side of the brain. Is it cortical or subcortical? Is the next question I need to ask in my brain. Has he got any cortical functions? There is no visual field defect. There is no inattention visual or sensory. There is no speech dysphasia, so it's not a cortical lesion, it's a subcortical lesion this man must be having. Is it in the anterior circulation or posterior circulation? It's the next question I need to answer to localize the lesion. We use the Oxford and Bramford classification. I'm sure you have gone through this in your final years. This is the part that is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral and the anterior cerebral artery. This is the posterior circulation. So we need to see whether it's anterior circulation or if it is anterior circulation, whether the whole thing anterior circulation is involved or whether it's partial. Whether it's posterior circulation and the other thing is if it's not belonging to all three of those, whether it's lacuna. Uh, this is classification in detail. This is there in all your textbooks. So anterior circulation, there will be limb weakness, vision problems, and high, all three higher functions affected. That is speech, vision, and inattention. Uh, partial one, there, uh, weakness will be there, but there will be one or two of the higher functions. That is, all three will not be affected. Lacuna ones, there is no higher functions affected. There will be only limb weakness or sensory impairment. Posterior circulation, there will be cranial involvement, nerve involvement, cerebral involvement, or isolated uh, vision problems. So going back to your patient, this is the findings. So we can decide he has got a right-sided lacuna stroke or syndrome. Why I say stroke or syndrome is because at this moment, I do not know whether it's an infarct or a hemorrhage. Going into the investigations, we do the random blood sugar because I told you hypoglycemia can mimic a stroke and we don't want the brain damage to get worse. Most important one that helps me in my management is a non-contrast CT scan of the brain. When we do the other blood basic investigations as well. Treatment of acute stroke depends on the type of stroke, whether it is ischemic or whether it is hemorrhagic. Ischemic stroke depends again whether it is management wise largely it's the same, but it depends again whether it's a, a TIA or a ischemic stroke. But TIA is basically you can manage as outpatients, but ischemic stroke you may have to admit. When you do the ischemic stroke in our patient, you might get an absolutely normal CT scan or, or some lesion because he's a left hand weakness. You are looking at right side. 
and you're looking at the basal ganglia area because we thought it was a lacuna one, a little drop like that. As time goes, the color changes. Here it might be normal. As time goes, the color changes and it is more easier to recognize. During the acute stage, we do a CT scan to exclude a hemorrhage and not to di diagnose ischemic strokes. Ischemic strokes are largely clinical diagnoses. If it is within four and a half hours since the onset of symptoms, the patient is a candidate for stroke thrombolysis. And if you're working in a hospital where there is a CT scan, you can thrombolyze the patient and get in touch with your senior SHO or your consultant and inform them that this patient is here. If there is no clear time of onset, or if it is more than four and a half hours since the onset of symptoms, assess swallow if they are unsafe to the NG tube and give aspirin 300 milligrams with a PPI or, or a ranitidine or omeprazole or whatever is available. We are told to give atavastatin 80 milligrams because the latest teaching is you have to bring down the cholesterol level by 40%, whatever the level at, is at that point. If the patient is on any antihypertensives, continue on that. All the other medications continue. We do not start new antihypertensive during the acute stage. Reason is when we uh, the body tries to take the blood pressure up and stabilize uh, to protect the ischemic penumbra. If we artificially bring uh, give antihypertensives and bring the blood pressure down, the damage to the patient's uh, ischemic penumbra will be more. So unless the blood pressure is above two hundred, we do not start new antihypertensives. We, even if we bring the blood pressure down in acute thrombolysis, we bring it down to below 180. Ideal blood pressure, they say, is somewhere around 160. Uh, going, so when you did the CT scan in our patient, you get a white blob like this. This cannot be missed, and this is due to a hemorrhage. It's the right side, right place, and this is the acute lesion. Management of a hemorrhagic stroke, there is the most important thing is to bring down the blood pressure. The teaching is we have to bring down the blood pressure to 130 to 140 during the, as soon as possible. We usually use intravenous uh, lobitalol. It is available because we, they are, that's the same drug that they use for hypertensive emergencies in uh, or preeclampsia in gynae obstetric wards. So usually it's available. If it is not available, you can use in, uh, GTN infusions. The next important step is to check whether the patient is on antithrombotics. Uh, if they are, if on oral anticoagulants, stop it. If they are on warfarin, or if it's a band, give IV vitamin K, 10 milligrams stat. If you have octoplex, you can give. If you don't have anything, you can give FFP six units. Next step is a to, third important step is to refer him to a neurosurgeon. I think all patients do not need referral to neurosurgery, so you can ask your seniors before you do the referral. For instance, our patient who has a very tiny hemorrhage is very deep will not be a good candidate for neurosurgery, especially if GCS is normal and disability is small. Uh, to reduce ice, we don't want the intracranial pressure going up. Therefore, this type of fluid we use is normal saline. We tend to elevate the head in a little. We do not put any ligatures, CVP lines, and, or anything on the neck as much as possible. If they have fever, give antipyretics, paracetamol. Uh, if the sodium is something we need to do daily, if it is low, we should correct it with 3% saline. Monitor the patient carefully. If there is, if the Glasgow coma, uh, things to do is to look for the develop consciousness and new neurology. What, monitor the pupils, uh, see whether the patient is becoming progressively drowsy look for bradycardia, hypertension, respiratory depression, which is called the Cushing's triad. And if there is any new neurology developing, repeat the scan and get in touch with the neurosurgeons. Assessing swallow is important because aspiration pneumonia is a very 
common complication and you can mechanical chemical pneumonias are difficult to treat if the patient is conscious and not drowsy get him up seated upright position well and give a spoon of clean water and see whether there is any evidence of aspiration but basically is the patient is choking on water if there is nothing give a little bit more maybe a tablespoon look for the same same signs if not Give, ask him to drink with a uh, sip from a cup and see if there is evidence. If there is no evidence of aspiration, you the patient is safe to take medications and food orally. If they are unsafe, keep needle by mouth and start normal saline or put a NG tube and give the nutrition and the medication. Usually, up to twenty four hours, they are okay on a normal saline drip. If you don't have to give any fluids. Refer to the speech and language therapist, and if the patient is on an NG tube, they might need the dietitian's advice. Next time when you go around the patient, look at the patient and see whether the neurology has worsened or same or improved. Check the patient's blood pressure, blood sugar. Look for evidence of aspiration pneumonia, orthostatic pneumonia, or other hospital acquired infection. Look at the calf to see whether they are having DVT. Uh, Look at the drug chart to see whether you have started the, all the tablets that needs to be started and stopped all the ones that are started. Don't wait for the SHO to come and look at the drug chart and tell you that you haven't done your job. Request the investigations that are needed. It could be a halter monitor or a young patient that might be some additional investigations. Check whether the patient is eating, has taken enough fluids, See whether they have developed new onset bubble incontinence, bladder incontinence, or retentions. Check the skin for skin damages due to pressure areas. We don't do carotid dopplers on everybody. We do it only on the anterior circulation. That also not in everybody, only with people who have non-disabling strokes or TIAs. If the patient deserves a carotid doppler, get it done as soon as possible. And if there is significant stenosis, that is, stenosis are more than 70% refer to the vascular surgeons or to a place where there is a vascular surgeon as soon as possible. If the ECG, baseline ECG was normal, arrange for the patient to have a halter monitor to check whether they are having paroxysmal atrial fibrillation because the management in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, we give oral anticoagulants not, and not antiplatelets. This is the list of post-stroke complications, whether there is aspiration pneumonia, recurrent strokes. Large strokes can cause malignant MCA syndrome, which is an, again a stroke emergency, which needs to be referred to neurosurgeons for hemicraniotomy. Is the patient developing seizures? Is there pressure damage, DVT, pulmonary embolism, post-stroke headaches, subluxations, post-stroke depressions, and infections? When you're walking around the ward, just check whether the patient is positioned well. We try to elevate, eliminate pressure from the uh, weak side because there can be pressure damage. They don't feel it, isn't it? There can be subluxations of the joints. So this is the right way to position them. Just make sure that they are done properly. When you go to do the diagnosis card, put the date of the stroke, which is important, side of the stroke, and the disabilities on admission and on discharge. If, uh, what treatment was given? Altiplase, aspirin loading, uh, was there oral, if it's a hemorrhage, was, was he on oral anticoagulants, was it uh, reversed, and the discharge medications. We, this, our patient was a cyclist. Usually, we don't advise people to drive for one month, so it is same for cycling. The reason is a person who has had a stroke has a higher risk of having a stroke within a month. We do not want them driving or cycling because if they have a stroke while on that, they can cause damage to themselves, pedestrians, and the other passengers. Plan the medication. When are they supposed to come back to the clinic? The, what did the stroke, the th therapist tell? The pressure care, catheter care, NG. If you're sending patients on these things, teach the family how to ensure that they are working and what how to follow them up. After acute stroke, rehabilitation is very, very important. We do uh, rehabilitation 
as soon as possible, as soon as the patient is medically stable, because that is the time the uh, brain cells which have survived are at the highest to learn. So start whatever the facilities you have in your hospital, start using them as soon as possible. My take home message for you is when you start your internship, remember if you ever, when you see a patient in, who is in the ward already or is admitted to hospital with some other problem, or if he comes to hospital with new onset, focal, loss of neurological function, always think of stroke and treat it as a medical emergency. Thank you. I got four more minutes. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Any questions? Did you all hear me? I feel as if you all have fallen asleep or something. We could hear you, madam. I think they are still asleep. But... <laughs> Any questions, please? Yes. If you have any questions, please unmute or you can put on the chat box. Uh, we have two few minutes. We can accommodate some questions as well. So, so I'd like to highlight uh, Dr. Anuja Rajapaksha is a uh, representation, representative of the National Coast Stroke Group in Ministry of Health. So that new guidelines will be published very soon. So thank you for your contribution for the stroke. Uh, development, madam. Thank you, Roshan. Uh, where is this? Uh, today's what eight for madam. How can we differentiate ischemic stroke from hemorrhagic stroke at base hospital set up as uh, so? There is absolutely no way of clinically differentiating a acute stroke from a hemorrhagic stroke. If a patient's level of consciousness is going down fast, we think it could be a stroke, but saying that. We don't know. It, uh, so only way to differentiate is by doing a, a CT scan. So that is why it is very important to do a CT scan. Some developed countries actually have uh, ambulances who go to their house to do the CT scan. So to save time, because that's the only way we can uh, differentiate. But saying that, if somebody comes with you and the neurological deficit has completely resolved, not that you're saying, you're examining the patient says it's completely back to normal. It could be a TIA. Uh, the guidelines say even for TIA, we shouldn't be giving uh, aspirin without uh, doing a brain imaging. But theoretically, you can give because the uh, completely resolved means it's unlikely to be a hemorrhage. There is no way to differentiate the two without doing a CT scan. Dr. Uh, Gunasena. Mm. Neurological weakness going on for two or, two or three days, could it be classified under TIA or stroke? So the definition of TIA stroke is neurological weakness going on more than 24 hours. That was the WHO definition of 2005, way, way before we started thrombolizing. So currently, at that time, neurological weakness be less than 24 hours was a TIA. That is because our, we used to do ward rounds only once in 22 hours. Thrombolizing era is much, much different. Uh, we believe TIAs last about 30 to 40 minutes, one hour. If it is going more than that, it is usually a stroke. Uh, what for practical purposes, when a patient comes to you and says, I have had weakness from two o'clock and if the weakness is still ongoing on the same day, consider it as a stroke and manage it as a stroke. 
if they say I had weakness when I got into the ambulance, but now it is completely resolved and you find no neurology, treat it as a TIA. Uh, you, uh, so neurological weakness ongoing for two, weakness can ongo, but the, it starts acutely. As I told you, I was running to the bus, but I fell because my leg was weak. That kind of acute thing will be there. So if it gradually, uh, the wrist was weak yesterday, then it went to the elbow, today the whole arm is there. They, uh, that kind of scattered weakness you don't see in acute stroke. It's usually the worst is at the beginning. And unless they have a repeat stroke, they generally tend to get better with time. But the other thing is, if it is, there is cerebral edema developing with a massive stroke, so they might, you might see some deterioration because of that. Mm, anything else? One side neurological weakness, uh, Dr. Adil. Uh, one side, the neurological weakness going on for two to three years, could it be classified? I think I answered that question. Have I come going back to the same one? Would it be a acute approach to a patient with elevated what would be the acute approach to a patient with elevated ICP man? So increased intracerebral pressure, we have to bring the pressure down. If they are bleeding because bleeding inside the, because there is bleeding inside the brain, you have to control the blood to reduce the size of hematoma expansion. And they, if it is still not, and they are neurologically deteriorating, you have to send to a neurosurgical unit for them to do. If it is following an ischemic uh, stroke where they have developed malignant malignant uh, MCA syndrome, again, you have to send to a neurosurgical tube so, uh, center you, so that they can remove the uh, skull and let the brain's uh, swallowing go down. If you are trying to ask me whether you should be using mannitol or uh, dexamethasone, both these, these things do not have evidence. Dexamethasone, we give for tumor, uh, cytogenic edema, which is following tumors, you give dexamethasone. Manitol, we can use it as a last resort to buy some time until you transfer the patient from a base hospital for a, to a hospital where there is neurosurgical facility, you can use it. But that is only to buy some time, but that is not a treatment. Treatment is to... Pre uh, not to use 5%, correcting sodium, leaving the sodium above 135, not to tie things around the neck so that the, if you're intubating and all, because then the venous flow won't come down and the pressure builds up there. Those are the little things we can do, but if the pre ICP is going up, they need to remove the, uh, the bleeding. But that is why the blood pressure control is very, very important because that will reduce the hematoma size. The same thing with oral anticoagulants or thing, you can reverse them. Sorry, I went over time. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, so I think um, we'll take some of the questions on the chat box. So thank you very much, madam. That is Dr. Anoja Rajapaksa on the latest on uh, stroke, acute stroke management. So thank you once again, madam. So uh, we go to the next lecture by Dr. Rang Gunasekar, consultant physician, on the uh, topic of initial management or seizures. Over to you, sir. So can you hear? Uh, I can good. hear. I am. Uh, so we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Can you hear no. me? Yes. You can share, sir. Can you see me now? Hello. Roshan, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Love that clear. Okay, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, this lecture, we will be discussing about uh, the initial management of seizures, right? So this is uh, uh, a very common uh, emergency that you will encounter in uh, in medical ward, pediatric wards, and even the surgical wards and obstetrics wards, right? So when you are starting internship, so this is uh, something that you need to be uh, very thorough and with the initial management. Let's uh, go ahead with the definitions first. Uh, epilepsy is a syndrome of two or more unprovoked seizures that occur more than 24 hours apart. And I need you to, to uh, reiterate the point, which is the two or more unprovoked seizures that occurs more than 24 hours apart. And what is an unprovoked seizure? Unprovoked seizures are distinct from a provoked seizure. Provoked seizures are that they are due to an acute condition such as toxic or metabolic disturbance, immediately antecedent of head trauma or very recent acute stroke. The term unprovoked seizures refers to a seizure of unknown etiology as well as one that occurs in relation to a pre-existing pre -existing bear condition or progressive nervous system disorder. So what is status epilepticus? It is five minutes or more of a continuous seizure, activity or recurrent seizure activity without return to baseline. Again, five minutes or more of a continuous seizure activity or recurrent seizure activity without return to baseline. I need to reiterate the time period. So clinical diagnosis of an, un, of an epileptic seizure required a detailed history taking, ideally an eyewitness account of the seizure. So when you are encountering a patient who comes to the ward, always make sure when you are taking the history, sometimes the patient might be able to give a history, but try to get an eyewitness account always almost always, if possible, even you can call a relative and see whether you can get an eyewitness account because that is an essential part of diagnosis of a seizure because it is a clinical diagnosis. So the other investig the investigations are ancillary findings which will help you to make the diagnosis, but it is a clinical diagnosis primarily. So any patient with seizure, 12 lead electrocardiography is essential because there are seizure mimics and it could be a blackout spell or a syncope, right? Especially in children and teenagers, we do the uh, EEG if the facilities are available, ideally within 24 hours. Right, so I'll skip the slide, I'll come back to it later. So history and exam. So you need to figure out whether it is an epileptic seizure, a syncope, or a psychogenic non-epileptic seizure, or a pseudo seizure. Could be epileptic seizure. If it is epileptic seizure, you need to figure out it's a provoked or unprovoked. Syncope, if it is a reflex, orthostatic or cardiac. How do you do that? Right. If it is a true seizure or a pseudo seizure, so there are certain characteristic that, characteristic that you would look for in a patient with true seizure. So there's a semiology that will be pertinent to a true seizure, right? So it's a resembling a known seizure pattern, a chronic, chronic pattern or a partial seizure with secondary generalization. So there's a pattern that you recognize. That pattern is not the eye of seizures. And especially in examination, there'll be lateral tongue bite, which won't be the eye of seizure. So sometimes patient can have tongue bite at the tip of the tongue because they can reach it. They can mimic a, a pseudo seizure. But lateral tongue bite pattern is more specific to two seizures. And the duration in a true seizure, unless the patient has gone into status, it's a short, Pseudo seizures can be like, you know, patient can have movement and then patient can have a different sort of 
uh, movement. There's no specific semiology or a pattern that you can elicit from C to C. And at the same time, the postictal phenomena. Postictal phenomena are usually observed in the pseudo seizure and the true seizures, you, you will be finding it. And there will be injuries, which are sometimes life threatening, which are which can which can which cannot uh, be a, a, a mimic. And if the seizure occurs during sleep, it's more towards pseudo seizure, as uh, to true seizure. And pseudo seizures usually don't occur during sleep. Right. And other thing is sometimes when you uh, get the patient to like, you know, uh, suggest the patient something, if this pseudo seizure can be provoked by the, a suggestion. Right. And so what are the conditions, other conditions which are mimicking pseudo seizures as was true seizures, pseudo seizure, syncope, some sleep disorders and cardiac arrhythmias, emotional outspurts, dissociative weakness, propatacts, migraine, and hypoglycemia. Right. How do you differentiate between a seizure and a syncope? Seizure, usually you will have an aura or focal symptom, sometimes olfactory hallucination, automatism, right? So it could be lip smacking, something like that. And syncope, there's a predominal one associated with palpitation, sweating, and the facial patient is feeling that patient is about to faint. So that features are not behind the seizure, right? And syncopes are usually brief, generally less than one minute. Seizures are more prolonged than that. And vitals are usually in seizure are elevated with patient tachycardic, blood pressure is goes up. In syncope, usually vitals are on the lower side. And most important thing is syncope, there's a rapid recovery. There's no post confusion or post drowsiness. And uh, lateral tongue bite and eye opening I talked about earlier. Right. What are the etiologies uh, that you could encounter? Because these things you should run in your mind because any of your patient can have any of these abnormalities. So you need to think of these etiologies in the back of your mind while attending to the patient. It could be a metabolic disturbance like electrolyte abnormality or any major organ failure, patient coming with uremia and uremic encephalopathy and patient can have seizure. It could be sepsis, patient can have severe sepsis or a CNS infection, which comes present with the seizure. So you need to manage the, the underlying cause while managing the seizure as well. So that's why you need to think about these etiologies in the back of your mind. So it could be a stroke. So the first presentation of the stroke can be a seizure. It could be an ICH, especially an ICH, right? You can come with, uh, uh, the patient can come with the ICH and SH can come with the uh, seizure. And drugs. So it could be uh, the uh, non-compliance of the already uh, anti-epileptic drug the patient has been on or a drug toxication. It could be uh, uh, poisoning or it could be a withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal or patient has addicted to sedatives or uh, any other drugs and the patient comes with the withdrawal. At the same time, it could be a hypertensive encephalopathy where the blood pressure is high and causing a cerebral hypoxia or a press syndrome, or other things are, such as autoimmune encephalitis or paraneoplastic syndrome. So all these things are necessary because you need to plan out the next step your management. Right, what are the chronic processes? These are more or less acute processes, chronic processes, Epilepsy, patient can have long-term drug treatment and the patient can have breakthrough seizures, chronic alcohol abuse, CNS tumors, or CNS pathologies. Right. So let's move on to a history. 
I hope you you all can read this thing. Uh, 18 year old woman is brought to the emergency department after having had a seizure. She was up late with friends the night before and drank some alcohol. Shortly after waking this morning, she collapsed without warning, injuring her face. Her boyfriend witnessed her having a generalized tonic tonic seizure with cyanosis during she bit the side of her tongue. Her first memory was waking in the ambulance. She had no previous seizures. Specifically, she has not had any involuntary jerks of the arms, legs on awakening. Blank spells, sensitivity to flashing lights. So here, there are very sinister signs and symptoms where the patient had uh, fallen, plus patient had injury to her face, patient had tonic-tonic movement, which was witnessed by the boyfriend, and patient had no recollection of the event that has happened, and patient had a lateral tongue bite, plus patient had only uh, uh, remember the things that when, when she woke up in the ambulance. Right. Right. How do you approach this patient? Now the patient has come to the ward, right? Patient has developed another seizure. So this could be a patient who was on the bed, right? Patient, you, uh, you can have a patient in the bed you can, who has developed a seizure. A nursing officer calls you and you need to go and attend. A patient goes to the bathroom and patient has fallen in the uh, bathroom. A patient was on the doorway, patient has fallen there. So you need to attend the patient wherever that is, right? At the same time, where there's, if there's anything, whether there's any sharp object, whether there's any injury, which will be, which, which is going to uh, uh, may, um, injure the patient. So you need to keep the patient in the safe environment. So remove any objectives, any objects, which would harm the patient, as well as you have to have a safe approach to the situation. Get the patient into the lateral, left lateral position. If the patient is sucking out secretions, uh, if so coming out of secretions, suck out the secretion and position the patient to, to where the patient can avoid injury. Plus, call for help. Get the nurses involved, get the attendants involved. So, Ask the patient to come with the emergency trolley or ask the patient to come with the, the emergency um, uh, bucket. So get that everything's regard. regard. And if, there, if, if you know, don't have an IV access, try, get the nurses to do the IV access or get your colleague to do the, uh, uh, get the IV access. So make sure that you play the role of a team leader, right? Delegate the task. Don't try to do everything by yourself, right? So safe approach, keep the patient safe, right? And as soon as you uh, see the seizure, document the time of the start of the seizure, right? So this is again the ABCDE approach that you need to do in as in any emergency. So ARV, approach the ARV, see whether the patient's the ARV is open, right? Connect the patient to the monitor, connect the person to the pulse oximeter, see the saturation, put the patient on oxygen face mask, high flow oxygen, right? And check for breathing. And at the same time, put the ECG leads and start the cardiovascular monitoring. At the same time, try to get the rhythm plus blood pressure, blood pressure as well as the oxygen saturation. If you have IV access, get the IV fluid, or if you don't have IV access, uh, you can go for the intra, intra osseous access. At the same time, get somebody to check the blood sugar using a glucometer, make sure that the patient is not hypoglycemic. If the patient is hypoglycemic, attend to it then and there with IV dextrose. Check the temperature, right? If the patient is having fever, 
At the same time, while controlling the seizure, take the blood cultures as a well last IV uh, start on IV antibiotics because I run I ran I ran through the the etiologies because you need to treat the etiology at the same time while managing the uh, the emergency. Get the as well as soon as the IV access is there. So get the full blood count, basic metabolic panel. I need to read this pair sodium, potassium, and calcium, and magnesium. So the, these electrolyte imbalances can precipitate a seizure at the same time. So if you have high, low, low sodium that has shown, so you need to start on 3% uh, sodium chloride if it is uh, recommended. If the blood gas facilities are available, so you can request for blood gas, so then you can have an idea about the basic metabolic panel. Continuously monitor the patient. So what are the drugs that is available at your dispense? If you have lorazepam, it is four milligram IV. You can repeat it in every five to 10 minutes. I, I, I will reiterate, you can repeat it every five to 10 minutes. So you you need you don't need you don't go 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 and immediately uh, give the patient with IV or spam omidazolam. You wait for thirty seconds to one minute, preferably about one minute. If the seizure does not settle, then you introduce um, lorazepam, omidazolam, or diazepam if that is what is available. So if you don't have an IV access, diazepam you can give intraoseous or even 20 milligram rectal. Midosalam, again, you can give IV or buccal or intraoseous. And some midosalam, you can give intranasal as well. Right? So there are new things which is coming up. If you have IV liver to the stem, uh, so if you uh, if the patient has had the seizure, then you had to give uh, lorazepam or midosalam or diazepam. You can give at the same time IV levetiracetam one to three gram as well because that has shown that the patient uh, 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 there's it reduced the chance of having a recurrent seizure. And at this time, if you uh, if the seizures are not controlled, once you uh, have given lorazepam, midazolam, or diazepam, the seizure is not controlled. You can repeat it in five minutes time. At the same time, get somebody to call help, call for help. Get to a, a senior hospice service enrolled. If your senior hospice service is not, not there, get to a registrar or senior registrar or somebody involved. If the seizures are not controlling, if it is goes beyond uh, five minutes, uh, five to 10 minutes, you can load the patient with phenytoin, which will, which will be commonly available. 20 milligram per kg over 15 to 20 minutes. Or IV fin barbitol or levotristatam. Right. And at the same time, you have to make sure while managing the uh, patient, you have to make sure the patient's ABC is intact. While managing the patient, check the again the airway, check the whether the patient's breathing. Check the ECG is running. The monitor is ECG, ECG rhythm is there. Check the blood pressure. So make sure the patient's vitals are being maintained. If the seizure is not controlled, proceed to intubate. And at this point, definitely you need senior help. If the seizure is prolonged, so you need, if the patient is um, not responding to liver stamp or IV phenytoin, then you will have to go for a, uh, IV midazolam infusion from a full low phenobarbital and patient needs to be electively intubated and ventilated. At the same time, I need to highlight another point here. The patient can have a convulsive seizure and a non-convulsive status epilepticus. Patient can have the tonic-clonic movement continuously or the patient is not recovering with the post drowsiness. That also needed the, to be managed as an status epilepticus where patient does not have convulsive seizure, but patient has non-convulsive status epilepticus. And see whether the patient has developed any complications like injuries, 
any weakness or oh, patient can have an aspiration so make sure that you are looking for those complications plus so my take home message is adapt to it as an emergency don't delay so always make sure that you are available at the right time at the right moment and uh, attend to the patient accordingly right thank you very much and if there is any question i would like to uh, attend to them Do you have any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. So, if you all have any questions, please uh, type in. Or you can unmute yourselves and ask. Uh, we have a few minutes until the next lecture. If you have any questions, you can ask me, you may ask now. So do we, uh, so Dr. In DNM Senanaika, so, so how do we treat a provoked seizure due to recent stroke? Is there anything special to do? Now, the patient uh, coming with a stroke, recent stroke, okay, patient has come with a seizure. Of course, you need to treat as usual. So you need to make sure that the seizure is subsided with the acute treatment. Then, of course, depending on whether it is an ICH or an infarct, it could be a, 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 a post-stroke complication, uh, it could be an extended infarct, it could be extended an ICH. So then you need to go for the imaging, right? And decide what needs to be, uh, what needs to do uh, uh, later on. But initial management, it is the same. There's nothing much uh, that uh, uh, you need to say. But however, there can be, uh, um, uh, uh, occasions where patient has had a stroke, patient coming with a seizure, it could be due to aspiration, pneumonia, and hypoxia. It could be due to electrolyte imbalances. So as I told you earlier, so you need to have those uh, differential diagnosis in mind and to request relevant investigation and attend to it appropriately. I hope I, I have answered that question. Any other questions? Right, I think that's all the questions. So if you all have more questions, you can still type type in. So thank you very much, sir. That's Ranga Gunasekar, consultant physician. And thank you, sir, once again. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is another interesting lecture by Dr. Vimlasir Ulwatak, uh, consultant physician, TH Rag uh, Karapitiya on leptospirosis. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ranga. Thank you, uh, uh, oh, Roshan. Sorry, yes. uh, uh, and just okay. 
Roshan, can you see my lecture? Uh, yes, sir. You need to make a full screen then you Okay, right. Thanks. Right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm Dr. Vimal Siluvatagi, one of the physicians from Karapiti Hospital. Now, leptospirosis <clears throat> is a common, uh, common febrile illness uh, you come, come across everywhere. Everywhere in Sri Lanka, if you have a plan to practice uh, as a doctor in Sri Lanka, you will come across this uh, wherever you go. So it's a, it's a disease that you all of you should know. Uh, whatever the field you are going to uh, practice in the future, uh, this is going to be one of the important conditions that all of you should have at least some kind of basic idea. So with that introduction, we go to the main uh, presentation. Leptospirosis is the most widespread zoonosis uh, in the <coughs> world. In, it presents all over the world except Antarctica, and uh, it causes more than 60,000 deaths per year. So it's a, a worldwide problem causing a significant medical uh, health issue. Uh, so uh, according to WHO uh, report, Sri Lanka is a, is the, is a highly endemic uh, country with leptospirosis. This is the map of, uh, world map of leptospirosis where you can see Sri Lanka is in red. Red indicates that the hyper endemic, uh, Sri Lanka is a hyper endemic country. So we are living in a hyperendemic country, and our, our country's uh, pro, uh, the population is prone to get this infection wherever they live. So there is a renewed interest of leptospirosis in currently world over and also in Sri Lanka. Why? Because uh, this uh, frequent epidemic occurs all over the world, and also in Sri Lanka too. There are major epidemics as well as uh, minor epidemics, and recently also we had a uh, a minor outbreak in, uh, in and around uh, Gold District. So it's uh, environment factor, factors mainly contributing to these uh, frequent ectopics. It's due to climatic change, as you all know, world over the climatic change is uh, taking stall and uh, causing uh, uh, this kind of uh, epidemics uh, all over the world. So apart from that, pollution is ever increasing and our garbage, garbage disposal and all these things are not in a proper uh, manner. So the popular pollution uh, is another cause of uh, increased epidemic. And overcrowding in, in, the, in the major cities and around urban areas is another uh, <clears throat> factor which predispose uh, this infection. And apart from that, one of the most important things that all of you should know and pay your attention that the leptospirosis, the disease of leptospirosis has changed in the recent past. In the past decade or two, within this past decade or two, the, the disease of leptospirosis has completely changed. The, its epidemiology has changed, its demography and its clinical patterns has changed. Ep uh, epidemiologically, it has been considered as a, a disease of rural uh, community, is mainly in agrarian uh, communities, but now it has come to migrate to uh, urban uh, areas as well. The demography, it, uh, it is considered to be uh, farmers and the high risk other ag uh, people who are engaged in agricultural activities are the highest risks and they are the uh, category of people who get affected. But now the things have changed and it has uh, spread to all uh, layers and sectors of society uh, without any reason. And this includes even school children. We had a very unfortunate death in the recent a uh, few weeks ago in uh, Karapitiya, uh, a school girl, a 13 year old school girl uh, with leptospirosis. So it, it has uh, gone across the society and affecting uh, all, uh, 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 whole society. So the clinical pattern thirdly has changed. It has been a, a disease uh, which was con considered to be uh, involvement of liver and uh, kidney, but it is not not so. There are severe, more severe forms of uh, clinical patterns are appearing with multi-organ involvement and increasing, uh, contributing to increasing uh, deaths. So <clears throat> the other important thing we have noticed in Sri Lanka when we observe our cases, the cl clinical pattern is changing geographically. So the different part of our country have different dominant clinical patterns. For example, in uh, West Zone, if you're going to practice in West Zone, 
uh, Gol, Mater, Ratnapura, Kegol, and perhaps in Kalambu, uh, you might come across this dreaded red, red complication of leptospheric, leptospheric pulmonary hemorrhage is uh, very much confined to its owner's country. So these are the new things that uh, make us interest and uh, to need to talk about this condition uh, to uh, make you aware of this condition. So something more about in Sri Lankan situation is a common uh, cause of acute febrile illness that you all know. And number of deaths due to leptospheric is significantly higher than deaths due to dengue. In uh, 2017, uh, dengue, uh, the total number of dengue uh, cases reported was the highest uh, number of cases, 200,000 cases. And we, are, uh, we had 400 deaths due to dengue. But uh, comparatively, leptospheric causes 730 deaths uh, during that year. So most of these patients die because of the multi-organ failure. And most of the fatal cases have lung involvement. So the estimated case fatality rate of leptospheric was more than 10 times of that of dengue. So what is your role in uh, controlling and uh, managing this patient as intern? So it is very important, first step uh, you can initiate either to take a proper history. I, I, I will highlight the, the importance of proper history, proper uh, clean, uh, oriented history uh, uh, is a very important in uh, initial management and diagnosis of this case. And also you, you have to help identify a suspected case. I'll go into the details of what suspected case is. And also, you are the person who will start differentiate it from other common febrile illness like dengue and other febrile uh, uh, common viral infections. So you need to have that knowledge to how to differentiate this disease from other common illnesses. And to order relevant investigation, which is very important in, at the initial stage, unlike uh, other illnesses, the in investigation play, basic investigation play a very important role. And also, <clears throat> proper monitoring of this patient once it is identified as a severe case it is your uh, duty to monitor these patients to detect complications so watch out for complications is your duty and also to initiate relevant treatment as early as possible without waiting your seniors i think this is one condition you can initiate specific treatment so you are <clears throat> so you need to know these things um, and the last but least, needs, not least, uh, the confirmation of this condition and the notification is very important. So with that, we go to a, a case scenario where you can, uh, uh, I mean, learn something more about this condition. What I'm going to talk about will be very much uh, in, in practical point uh, in this case. So we have a 14-year-old schoolboy admitted to Karapitya uh, some time ago with fever, arthralgia, myalgia of three days. And on examination, he was febrile and his respiratory uh, findings are normal and he's, he was mildly tachycardic and his abdomen uh, and the rest of the investigation were uh, unremarkable. The basic investigation done on admission reveals WBC of 9,000 and uh, with predominantly neutrophilic and hemoglobin was 10.6 and plated the low, it's 78,000. Creatinine was normal, CRP is a bit high, 56, and uh, rest of the investigation normal, including dengue antigen. So, uh, so how to differentiate it from dengue? Luckily, with this patient, you get this uh, negative dengue. Uh, antigen report, but if it is if if there is no uh, uh, investigations uh, like that uh, on admission, how are I going to differentiate? So history plays a very important role because uh, in diagnosing leptospirosis, that this exposure to contaminated water is a uh, definite criteria you, you need, the patient need to fulfill to qualify uh, to be diagnosed as leptospirosis. So history of being exposed to muddy water, contaminated water or wet soil for that matter, or working in a rat infested area can be considered as positive exposure for leptospirosis. And also the myalgia is a very dominant clinical feature in leptospirosis, especially in the lower back, thighs and calves. And headache, for the, when you compare with dengue, the headache is not a dominant feature in uh, leptospirosis. And in basic, basic uh, investigation, if you do, the, there is a very early rise of serum creatinine, which is very evident in the second or third day of illness. 
which is not uh, commonly happening in other viral or other infections. And rise in CRP is again a very early findings and usually it is out of proportion to the patient's illness. And microscopic hematuria and proteinia, all this uh, suppose the uh, favors the diagnosis of uh, leptospirosis. So clinically, you can uh, make the uh, suspicion of the diagnosis and it is, uh, that's why your role as a, a first contact doctor is important to make a proper history and directed uh, uh, initial investigation to uh, support your uh, suspicion. So the question is continuing, even though he's a 14 year old school boy, the low platelet and high CRP uh, make uh, us to query whether this is a case of leptospirosis we are dealing with. So when we further uh, get, get into the history, we got to know that he has actually, the, he has a uh, exposure history to muddy water. He has briefly stepped into the paddy field where his father was working. So there was a positive uh, uh, exposure history. So the investigation they repeated shows uh, further confirms our uh, suspicion. The serum creatinine became 156 and uh, CRP uh, went up to 110. And uh, so that further confirms our uh, working diagnosis of suspected case of leptospirosis. So what is this uh, suspected case of leptospirosis means? Now, you know that <clears throat> uh, according to our uh, guidelines, of management of leptospirosis, Sri Lankan guidelines of management of leptospirosis. Any uh, person who is coming with acute febrile illness and high risk exposure to contaminate water, uh, with two, two of the following uh, features, can be taken considered as a suspected case of leptospirosis. So, myalgia, headache, arthralgia, meningitis, uh, anuria, jaundice, all these things. Any two of these things plus febrile illness with high risk exposure can be taken as suspected case of leptospirosis. What is the need, why you need to define this uh, as suspected case of leptospirosis? You know that it is uh, unlike uh, dengue, where the diagnosis is very much uh, available within a uh, few hours after admission by doing uh, antigen or antibody, you are sure that you are dealing with a case of dengue. Uh, in case of dengue, but in leptospirosis, it's not so clinic. It's a mainly a clinical diagnosis initially, and confirm it because the confirmation takes time because we, you need to confirm confirm it by sending uh, serum to uh, uh, MRI, and then that take uh, time to confirm. So, <clears throat> why the early diagnosis is also very important to initiate treatment because initiating treatment or antibiotic specific antibiotic for this condition. Actually, you can curtail a lot of problems and you can avoid a lot of uh, further complications of leptospirosis if you initiate treatment at correct time in the initial stages of illness. So that's why this uh, uh, case uh, definition as suspected case of leptospirosis is important. Uh, so the, if, you, uh, if I'm going to further highlight the importance of exposure history, actually, uh, it is very important to explore the history of uh, more than, uh, beyond the, the history of just asking whether the person has worked in the paddy field or not. There is a lot more to ask. And uh, there are a few examples. Actually, we came across a grade eight student who came to hospital uh, and clearly a case of leptospirosis. The only exposure that he we could find was he, he was cleaning his uh, classroom with his friends on the first day of uh, school time. So <clears throat> there's, there was another a uh, patient who, uh, who is a temple cleaner. He has never worked in a uh, muddy area, but his only exposure, probable exposure, would have been the cleaning of the shrine room where it was uh, uh, very much um, infested with rats. Another case, a software engineer who works in Colombo came with a clear case of leptospirosis and only exposure history was he's been uh, taking a bath in a uh, river while he's on a, a trip. So this kind of very subtle things the patient might not uh, remember, but just uh, explore the uh, history and to see whether there is a positive history. <clears throat> now we are with a uh, febrile patient with a febrile illness and possible exposure history and compatible symptoms. So it's a case of suspected uh, leptospirosis. Now, what are the few in, uh, basic investigations that you need to order? The full blood count, CRP, UFR, serum creatinine, and SGOTPT. So, 
So we did all these things and 24 hours after, our patient is start reducing urine output. You see urine output 150 ml per six hours uh, uh, during past six hours. So it, it get getting reduced, he's becoming oliguric and his blood pressure start to drop. He's from 110 by 70 to 90 by 60. His saturation also dropped and he became tachypneic. And further, uh, in 40 hours, after few, some, some time later, again, his saturation started to drop further from 91 to 75. He needed uh, noradrenaline to con maintain his blood pressure. And in 24 hours time, that, is, that was on the fifth day of illness, he started coughing out blood. And uh, we, when we did chest x-ray at that time, it showed bilateral changes of uh, evidence of uh, pulmonary edema and uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. So we did blood gas and that showed arterial hypoxia PO2 62. So this was the first X-ray on admission and this was the X-ray on 48 hours after admission to the hospital showing bilateral small nodular opacities right more than left, which we call alveolar shadows or cotton wool shadows. And it's a very likely to be due to pulmonary hemorrhage. So our work in diagnosis uh, actually uh, changed from uh, uh, leptos, just leptos, suspected cases, leptospirosis to leptospirosis complicated with pulmonary hemorrhage. So traditionally, the leptospirosis is a disease uh, of more uh, nearly more 90% of the case time, it's milder form, which is considered to be anecteric. So we were told that more, all these anecteric leptospirosis are usually milder form. But when the patients have severe leptospirosis, usually they become ecteric, which is not true anymore. So <clears throat> now the cl uh, clinical features depend on the organs involved. This is the change that, that, that has happened over the uh, years now. Earlier, it has been a, a disease of confined to liver and kidney, but it has uh, started to uh, encroach into and affect the other organs as well, causing a uh, lot of other uh, organ failures. Uh, what you need to know is that no organ or system in the body is immune to leptospirosis. It may be renal, it may be hepatic, it may be pulmonary, or it may be cardiac manifestation. Depending on the which organ get uh, more affected, the patient will show the dominant clinical feature, picture. So the uh, icterus is not synonymous with uh, severe leptospirosis, especially the higher mortality is associated when there is a pulmonary involvement, which is usually more than 70%. And that goes further up when there is a concomitant renal and cardiac involvement. So it is, as I told you before, the 90% of the time leptospirosis is a mild form of disease. And only the problems gives only when it becomes severe uh, case of leptospirosis. It's, it's only 10% of the uh, patients of leptospirosis develop uh, severe uh, the complications. So how are I going to differentiate mild from severe? That is very important. And that is uh, actually you need to initiate this uh, process of differentiating from mild from uh, the severe form of leptospirosis from mild form. So what are the features to, you need to look for? The acute kidney injury uh, with reduced urine. With this, it's very important to uh, mention that it's acute kidney injury, oliguric acute kidney injury. Why? Because acute kidney, kidney injury, the rise of creatinine is very common in leptospirosis, even in mild cases. But their urine output is usually normal or high. They are polyuric states often. But if, the, if your patient showing rising creatinine with reduced urine output, you are dealing with a case of severe leptospirosis. The persistent hypotension is a uh, sign of severe leptospirosis. So normally, in mild cases, hyper, there is no cardiovascular involvement and persistent hypotension indicates that patient is having severe infection, causing uh, a shock state uh, due to uh, leptospiremia. So there's a case uh, uh, evidence of severe leptospirosis. Tachypnea, hypoxia, hemoptysis, and chest X-ray infrared, all these suggest pulmonary involvement. So this again, a case of severe leptospirosis. EC changes and echo findings, so whatever the positive cardiac findings suggest myocarditis, leptomyocarditis, again, uh, 
if these, uh, your patient had these kind of uh, evidence, uh, you can call them as, or you can categorize them as, or you can identify them as severe leptospirosis. So what are the monitors? How are you going to detect these uh, patients uh, once they are admitted in the hospital? What is the way of uh, uh, that is, you need to monitor certain parameters, and uh, if you uh, start uh, monitoring pulse and blood pressure, you can definitely uh, detect low blood pressure, and that is evidence of shock. And if you start uh, monitoring respiratory rate and uh, saturation, especially this respiratory rate is very important because we don't pay much attention to this, and it's a very early sign of uh, pulmonary involvement, and uh, all these things you need to add the patient's progresses uh, and stay in the ward. You need to pay attention to race, respiratory rate, saturation, whether the patient is going to develop hemoptysis and do uh, serial chest x ray with, to see whether the patient has got uh, chest x ray positive findings to indicate pulmonary hemorrhage. And again, the renal involvement can be monitored by urine output and uh, uh, doing UFR, serum creatinine, and electrolytes. So that will indicate acute kidney injury and its provision. And if you do ECG and troponin, you will uh, be able to detect myocarditis. So these are the parameters that you need to monitor as house officer uh, to uh, detect, uh, identify or differentiate mild cases from severe cases. What is the pathophysiology of ac acute kidney injury leptospirosis? It's mainly acute tubular necrosis in the initial state. You know, the, the leptospirosis can be found uh, in lep uh, kidneys and it can uh, exert a direct toxic effect to tubules and that cause direct uh, uh, acute tubular necrosis, which happen very early in the state disease. And that is why it is important to uh, initiate antibiotic quite early so, so you can uh, retard this process. And secondly, uh, the uh, acute kidney injury can further exacerbated by acute interstitial nephritis, which is an immune mediated uh, uh, damage, which occurs uh, sometime later in the disease. And dehydration and rhabdomyosis also can contribute to acute kidney injury. For the myocardia, usually the myocarditis is a difficult uh, condition to uh, detect if you go by clinical uh, symptoms or signs, because not much of uh, specific signs or symptoms uh, which will indicate uh, myocarditis, but if you do ECGs, there will be invariably there will be a lot of changes. So, T and ST segment uh, uh, changes, AV conduction blocks, and sometimes arrhythmias uh, will be visualized in the X rays, ECGs. And if you do echocardiogram, there will be regional wall motion abnormalities, and uh, troponin is usually elevated in severe cases of myocarditis. And what about the pulmonary involvement? This is a normal. Uh, card, I mean, uh, basic uh, diagram of an alveolus, and this on your right, you get a, uh, some sort of histological diagram where you can see this uh, greenish uh, tapering uh, thing is uh, uh, we call type one pneumocytes, which uh, which is in very close proximity to cal uh, alveolar capillary that makes the alveolar capillary membrane. In leptospirosis, what happens is there is a linear deposition of immunoglobulin and complements over the alveolar surface of this alveolar capillary membrane. And then it, uh, if, uh, it, uh, it causes a direct damage to this most important alveolar capillary uh, membrane, causing uh, bleeding into alveoli. So that is the, uh, the, path, uh, I mean, the pathophysiology of al alveolar hemorrhage in leptospirosis. It's me. me it's definitely immune mediated uh, injury. So there is a immune process going behind this and causing uh, the hemorrhage. So pulmonary hemorrhage can be very severe on the patient we manage and can see the extent of uh, 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 bleeding and causing bilateral, uh, almost white out uh, lung field. And there's another patient who came to us with a similar uh, sort of clinical picture and uh, got uh, respiratory arrest after coughing out blood. And we uh, intubated and you can see that it tube, it tubes containing blood. So it's blood coming out through the tube. So there is a massive, there was a massive hemorrhage, again, pulmonary hemorrhage. There was another patient who uh, uh, died because of the severe pulmonary hemorrhage. You can see that this is the, uh, the, uh, 
lung cut open in the during uh, post mortem and you can see the extent of bleeding into lung uh, which causes uh, death of this patient so how are we going to manage these patients <clears throat> Now, it's very important that you need to correct dehydration. Most of these patients come dehydrated, so it's, it can contribute uh, renal failure, and also it can uh, cause a lot of other complications as well. So correct dehydration normal saline, but try to uh, not to overload if you're suspecting pulmonary hemorrhage. Now, it is very important to highlight that you need to continue monitor essential parameters like uh, what I mentioned before. is uh, very important that you start antibiotic quite early in the disease as you suspect uh, a case as a leptospirosis. Is one of the conditions, the in, uh, intern houses are given free hand to start antibiotics. So what are the antibiotics? If you are considering your patient is a mild case, you can start oral doxycycline, 100 milligram BD. And in case if a uh, patient cannot uh, tolerate or in case of uh, pregnancy also, you can use acetromycin 500 milligram daily. And in severe case, if you think your patient is a severe case of leptospirosis, you can go for intravenous uh, antibiotics like penicillin or ketraxone. So probably if the patient uh, remain in high uh, uh, hypotension despite your fluid correction, uh, you may need to consider inotropes, especially noradrenaline will be very handy in managing this patient. So initiate uh, inotropes. And oxygen therapy, if the patient is showing evidence of pulmonary uh, involvement, you may need to start oxygen therapy and escalate according to your senior's advice. And one of the very important things that you need to remember is that if you suspect your case is you are handling a case of severe leptospirosis, please uh, get your senior's opinion. Inform your senior uh, house officer or the registrar or the consultant. So how are, you do, how are you going to manage severe cases of leptospirosis? It's very essential to continue again close monitoring to looking, look for uh, low saturation, hemoptysis, do serial uh, creatinine to see the monitor the progress of uh, acute kidney injury. And HB level is important because uh, these patients tend to lose a lot of blood and at times you may need to arrange blood transfusion as well. So, Standard management is uh, once the acute kidney injury is seen, you have to start initiate standard management or fluid management and other things. And if the patient is heading for severe ACA, you need to place with the renal team and um, uh, arrange hemodialysis. And in the case of pulmonary hemorrhage, there are specific treatment. The one important uh, treatment available is IV methylprednisolone, which is 500 milligram daily for three to five days can be given. So you have to, if you are going to initiate this treatment, you have to initiate this treatment quite early in the disease. When you start this uh, treatment quite early in the uh, case of pulmonary hemorrhage, which gives very good results. And plasma exchange, uh, as I told you before, this uh, pulmonary uh, hemorrhage is a uh, Immune uh, is, is, is a result of immune damage, immune uh, complex, complex uh, getting deposited in the pulmonary uh, alveolar capillary membrane. And if, if, uh, if there is a way of removing this immune, uh, toxic immune products uh, from the plasma and replace it with uh, fresh frozen plasma, and that uh, would be an ideal uh, treatment for. Uh, this patient. And this is exactly what happens in plasma exchange, where you would uh, you ex uh, uh, remove uh, patients, uh, the portion of say, patients' uh, uh, plasma with uh, toxic products and uh, re reintroduce uh, fresh frozen plasma. And this, uh, we did this, uh, uh, actually, we employed this uh, therapeutic modality first time in Parapita when we had a lot of patients with pulmonary hemorrhage, and we uh, published data, this data, and we uh, confirmed and shown that it is effective. And it, now it is being widely available uh, all over the country, being practiced in many uh, centers in the country uh, to save life. So IVIG is uh, again has been proposed as a, a way of uh, modality of treatment, but we don't have enough evidence to confirm this. So meanwhile, as house of the, you need to arrange blood transfusion. This patient, if the blood pressure uh, patient's hemoglobin is dropping, 
dangerous to a dangerous level. And also, you, you may, may have to arrange platelet transfer, especially in case of if you are preparing patient for hemodialysis or uh, plasma paralysis, you need uh, this uh, femoral catheter in. So for that, you need to maintain adequate plated uh, level. At least 50,000 of uh, uh, plated would be ideal to uh, do this kind of invasive procedure. So uh, in case if the patient's platelet is lower than that, you may have to arrange plated transfusion as well. So that is your duty. And <clears throat> again, while you are managing the situation, patients' uh, severe cases, leptospice is your duty to confirm, uh, to send the uh, blood for confirmation test, which is a microagglutination test, which is serum taken seven, seven days of after uh, the onset of disease. So if you uh, send blood or serum to MRI, it will take only a few days to get this report uh, to your hand. So uh, send it to MRI and try to contact them uh, to see whether the report is ready. Usually within 24 hours, it is ready. So. <clears throat> But that's again your duty, and apart from that, notification is very important when you are uh, before discharge. All these patients, even the suspected case of leptospire, you can notify. So, this is what we did to our patient. Actually, we employed uh, three uh, plasma exchanges for this is a the plasma exchange, it's a simple uh, machine, uh, it's a simple procedure, and uh, then he, uh, after three, sorry. After three uh, plasma paralysis, you can see that the X-ray has improved and he improved quite dramatically and he made a very uneventful uh, recovery. So in summary, leptospire is a common cause of febrile, acute febrile illness. Exposure history is very important for early diagnosis. And, <clears throat> And uh, it is very important uh, to distinguish severe cases from mild cases clinically. And it's close and continued monitoring is very important to detect a life-threatening complication. Early initiation of antibiotics is important and plasma exchange uh, would be effective for treatment of pulmonary hemorrhage. So that's all I have to tell you. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer. Thank you. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, if you all have any questions, please type in now. We can unmute and ask. We have one or two minutes for that. Uh, so, I have a question. Uh, yes. Is there any place to do a CSF culture alongside blood culture before we start antibiotics, or just blood culture is enough? Blood cultures would be more than enough. Uh, see, what, what do you mean by CSA? Because, uh, because very CSF culture. No. Is it necessary? No. No, no, not, not necessary. But unless okay. you are suspecting some sort of uh, CNF uh, associated uh, complication, uh, you need not to. Okay, sir. So, thanks. Anything? Okay, Roshan, we can, I think, we can continue. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Thank, think, you uh, thank you very much, sir, for that uh, comprehensive lecture on leptospirosis. Um, it was Dr. Vimla Sirulwatha, senior lecture, senior consultant at TH uh, <coughs> Therapy. Thank you, sir, once again. Thank so, you. So, uh, next up is another interesting lecture by Dr. Premal Jayasekar. Madam, are you there? One second, I am sharing the slides. Okay. Share, I can hear now. Next is Sanchu Dana. Are you? You can't make a thing in full of Mm -hmm. 
Can you see the slides? Yes, madam, can see. Need to make it full screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll start. Good morning, everyone. So we will be moving to some other tropical problem in the country, snake bites. Um, now, not only the people who are going for a, a places where forests are there, but uh, the snakes are, but even in a Colombo, now we do see vipers and not. So I will be talking to you about the venomous snakes. I'm not going to tell that how to identify all these things because um, you were taught in your medical school, those, those things. And uh, mainly what I want to teach you is how to tackle when you get a, a snake bite, which patient to give antimony, which one not to give, and prevention of um, other complications. So we'll start with this MCQ. It's a 66-year-old man who was admitted after Russell's five bite. He was treated with antivenom. Uh, he was treated with antivenom and reassessed after six hours. Which of the following is an indication for repeat administration of antivenom? Persistent respiratory failure, 20 whole blood clotting time more than 20 minutes, severe swelling of the bitten limb, Reduce urine output diplopia. So, what will be the uh, answer? So, once I finish, the, I think you might be knowing the answer by now. But if the people who are not knowing might understand the end of the lecture. So, not all, all uh, you know, these are not the all snakes are not venomous. You can see. Okay. So we'll start with this uh, uh, cobra. And uh, so usually you can identify with these spectacles kind of thing in his hood. But uh, you know, when the people bring them uh, dead snakes, you might not be able to. So you may have to use other methods to identify the snake. And every hospital, usually, they have a photographs of all these venomous snakes where you can compare with the things. And the, sometimes the people who bring the cobra might know better than us. But uh, you should be able to identify them, okay? And this one, you can see very nice, uh, this Russell Swiper, the beautiful one with these uh, 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 three rows of chains. Um, and... Uh, that, of course, we have to identify. You have to differentiate it from your hump, the hump nose and uh, other people. So this is the Russell Swiper. And this one is uh, Indian Crate. So we have, uh, yeah, we have, this, is, this is Indian Crate. Uh, this is the Ceylon Crate. So you can see the this Indian Crate and Ceylon Crate, whatever the venom is same, but they are the stripes. They have this Indian guy has the, the two uh, stripes to, uh, close by the other guy has a single stripe. And uh, this is this is one of the snakes, very difficult to identify because, and this snake is not available in everywhere. Usually in the um, kind of uh, north, uh, Central province and all. And this is a so scaled viper, again available in the Manai and all, but unfortunately, because of the sand transport from those areas to here, they might come with sand, thing, sand uh, lorries, and uh, people might come with the snow snail bike even in Kalamu. So that is how to be careful. Now, actually, even though I have not mentioned here, uh, hump nose viper also under the category of venomous snake because uh, it, its effect, effects are venomous. That is like see that um, effects of hump nose wipes are serious. So they now hump, consider hump nose wipe also as a venomous snake. But I will be talking about the hump nose later on. Okay, how do we manage? But these things now um, when a patient coming with the history of snake bite, the, mainly the first aid is important. And uh, 
so when so resuscitation might be patient might be collapsed uh, maybe low bp maybe respiratory array so it depends on uh, what patient presentation is and uh, so we have to when a patient comes to you first thing is to uh, now actually we are not at the site of the snake bite they bring the patient to the hospital we will be in the hospital so just you just you, you use, use your abc and then assess the patient and then once your patient is stable just see the assess for the signs of envenomation you can't take five minutes to history five minutes to examination everything should be done simultaneously you may remember when you come to viva and things you have been telling all those things like that you are doing everything very simultaneously uh, taking history quick targeted history and all it is then you have to act now uh, the way you have explained there so you assess for the signs of innovation which i will be talking to you later and then you identify the snake and the tetanus toxoid even though it's written here we are not going we are not uh, interest of going, giving tetanus toxoid when they arrive because maybe uh, maybe a hump nose maybe a russell's maybe cobra they might be bleeding so the tetanus toxoid might be the last thing uh, we might give and then you monitor the patient. So this is what you do when they initially come to your ward. And what are the things you do and what are things you don't? So that's, you have to now um, like do sexually that the initial remove the patient to a safe area. Sorry, it's a safe area. Uh, usually it will be done by the whoever they are, not us. So immobilize the bitten part. So um, can wash the wood with soap and water. And then the main thing is, imagine if it is a finger bite or something, remove the bangers, uh, things, and the, even the denims or something, if they were in uh, this uh, tight clothes and things, take, and take them out. Because they are in pain, give some paracetamol. We are giving only paracetamol for pain. And don'ts are, now these are things actually other people do. This is not for you because uh, I always used to show this slide because it's very important even for any anyone else, things we are not doing. Okay, so resuscitation, I told you. So airway, you start with that. If the patient is talking to you, you don't want to bother about that. And uh, if there are vomitors or anything after the vomit, just try to clear the airway, suck out the secretions, the breathing, the uh, we cough. We can ask the patient to have a cough. So it, the patient is going to get respiratory muscle paralysis. So the, immediately you can start with them in the patient and put in the oropharyngeal airway, or then uh, we have to get uh, shouted for the team, just ready for the intubation. The circulation, so low blood pressure and the weak pulse. So you know it is this, uh, going to be the circulatory collapse or the vasodilatation due to the antivenom. Immediately do the IV access and the, from the same tide or uh, so, and then you start some, if the blood pressure is low, you can start some normal saline bolus. So why do they get hypertension? It is a hypovolemia as a result of widespread vasodilatation. So these are the effects they get, local effect, they come with swelling, bistring, tissue necrosis, so the systemic effects, um, it depends on the venomous snake. Early non-specific abdominal pain, you may have heard a very um, the famous one is that is the crate and nausea, vomiting, hypertension. And if we do the counts, it counts might be high. Specific features are neurotoxicity, spontaneous systemic bleeding, rhabdomyolysis with myoglobinuria and coagulopathy. So you can see these uh, pictures. You can see the myoglobinuria, the toosis, and the bleeding. So now, these are the specific things you see. If a Russell viper comes, there will be local swelling, and there will be bleeding from the wound itself. And he can have both neurotoxicity and coagulopathy as well. Neurotoxicity, we might see the external ophthalmoplegia, toosis, then the coagulopathy, uh, dark urine, and uh, this your whole blood clotting time is high. 
if we do the PTIN, because idea is a whole blood clotting time is unique thing because we can do it as a bedside thing. That is why we don't go rush for the PTIN or we do the whole blood clotting time. The cobra, there will be local swelling and tissue necrosis. That will be nasty tissue swelling, uh, necrosis with the cobra bite. And they get more prominently neurotoxicity, but they can have increased coagulability as well. Okay. And the crate, usually crate, when even no one knows whether the crate was bitten or not. Usually, you know that the story is they are sleeping on the floor. There will be a crate bite found next time dead or respiratory arrest. So this, even uh, the crate bite marks, it's very difficult to find, but they come with the neurotoxin. They don't have no coagulability with crate. So how do we know signs of innovation? So now, even though I have explained all these features, some when a, some snakes might come with the florid things as I explained, some might not, some may be halfway. So because of that, we have to see, we need to have evidence to see whether our patient is actually bleeding. Then that is why this 20 minute whole blood protein time is there. So what we usually do is first two, first six hours we do two hourly, then we do six hours. How do we do? Collect two ml blood into a clean, dry test tube and leave it undisturbed for 20 minutes. And then you can tear the tube at the end of 20 minutes and see whether the blood has clotted or not. If the blood flows, not clotted, there's a coagulopathy. If clotted, we consider there is no coagulopathy. So that is the most you can. Now you have put the cannula, you would have sent full blood count, creatine, electrolyte, all those things with that you would have sent PTINR, yes. But this one is a kind of a point of care test you do then and there. So this is the first test you do, okay. So now this will help in decision regarding AVS administration or vigilance and preparedness for complications. And then you then, you identify your snake. Now, now imagine uh, they are, you are not sure because usually people are, pe sometimes people might bring, sometimes people not bring the snake. If they bring the snake, so you are, try to identify the snake with, with the way we learned and the look with the help of others or whatever. And uh, you have to make sure, you know, even the dead, uh, dead snakes are where people say live, so you don't touch them and just see. Now looking at the whole blood clot in time and identifying the snake will help us to get a decision regarding AVS administration and or to anticipate. Sometimes initial, if they don't show anything like first one or two hours, then when time goes, if it's a Russell soybean, maybe it's a third of so the six, uh, six hours of time, he might start bleeding. So you are prepared to that. So that is why we need to identify the snake. You do the whole blood cut in time. Meantime, you identify the snake. If they have not bring the snake, you just ask a small history to understand whether it is a crate bite. So usually now uh, the people themselves come and tell like the Kurunayagala, Kantane, those areas because the, the season, the harvesting season, there are a lot of vipers. So people say that they have seen the viper. So what you have to do with, assuming it is a viper, you go by the whole blood clot in time and other features, systemic features. So we monitor the patient. What are the things you are going to do? Level of consciousness. And that doesn't mean you, know, you need to do the GCS, but you can do the, you know, AVPU or GCS. Just you talk to the patient, see whether your patient is drowsy or losing consciousness. And the pulse rate, whether he's tachycardic, blood pressure, whether he's dropping his blood pressure. And the respiratory rate and hydral volume, you can get the respirometer from the ICU, or you can just observe his um, respiratory muscles, how it works, and you can see the work of breathing looking at the patient. And the temperature. So they start rising fever and the urine now. At the same time, you start monitoring urine now. But if you have a doubt, if you are a slightest doubt, it is hump, uh, it's a hump nose, uh, not the hump nose, sorry, it's a um, Russell's viper. You can start catheterizing the patient before the patient developing coagulopathy. Then you can 
same time you can see the uh, you can see the uh, bleeding hematuria as well as reduced urine output and the fluid balance. So uh, how much you, now you know if the sometimes patient uh, coming from they usually first time they go to the Ayurvedic physician at the village and they come to us. So sometimes they say them to uh, drink in coconut water and come to the hospital. So they might be overloaded by the time they reach to the hospital. So you have to be uh, careful to see uh, what is the, your patient's state. And these are the things you have to avoid. However, your patient shouts, don't worry, just don't give any NSAIDs or aspirin, especially aspirin. So if the patient is a my patient on aspirin, you can't give, okay? And no IM injection. That is why I told you, even though I told initially our patient is supposed to get the tetanus toxoid, we know that patient need, but we are not going to give it. And we uh, uh, we don't uh, usually uh, administer other serous things, uh, other serous like FFP or something with the ABS. My, if we really want to do it, we will do separately because otherwise we don't know which one he got allergy and no narcotics or other respiratory depressions. If you look at this plan of action, now if there's a no signs of envenomation, your observation for at least 24 hours was sign of systemic envenomation. No signs of systemic envenomation. So after 24 hours, yes, you can discharge. If there are signs of systemic envenomation because you are doing this the whole blood coating time, you are monitoring your patient, and then you do give antivenom. The starting with signs of envenomation, if there are obvious systemic, just you just start then and there. And then um, if the local envenomation, give me a So if there are signs of uh, local envenomation only, still you observe your patient to see whether any whether your patient is developing systemic, then envenomation signs you go for antivenom. So if there are features of systemic envenomation, that means any systemic features or whole blood caught in time with evidence of this particular snake bite, identification of snake bite by the history or uh, examining the snake or whatever. So these four ones, Russell Swiper, Cobra, Crate and so scaled, we give antivenom, okay, immediately. So what we say is it's never too late to give AVS if, if systemic features are available. So what we do is, um, uh, now, patient comes now, might develop systemic envenomation in 12 hours, 18 hours, still you start antivenom by that time, okay? Now, we don't give antivenom for local envenomation unless for uh, cobra, cobra bites. Cobra bites also, it should be more than one third of the limb should be affected locally. So, we don't give antivenom for hump nose or green pit or a tree snake, okay? So what is the dose? You may have seen as a medical student, usually the nurses get uh, 10 ampoules, ampoules. So 10 will be 10 into 10 is 100 ml. So you take the 100 ml out from the normal cell and the nurses will prepare that. That is how you prepare the thing one fight. For a wipe bite, we may start now wipe bite in the Russell wipe bite. We usually don't only give 10. We may start with 20. Okay. Now the guidelines say that you can, if you are sure it's a Russell wipe, you start with 20. You give, give the 20, then you repeat your whole blood cutting time in six hours. If it is increased, you again, you can give another 10 or 20. Okay, it depends. But rest of the snakes, like crate, cobra, soske, the 10 wires is enough that you have to keep in mind. So what we usually, end point of AVS therapy for usually, um, the except Russell's wiper, rest of the snakes, 
the whole blood clotting time get better. So you may not need to give too much things. Now here, uh, Russell's, you give antivenom 20 vials, you repeatedly give it six hours hourly until whole blood clotting time is normal. But there's a one indicate one uh, uh, one indication kind of thing. You might not be imagine we have given four or five times every six hourly given that. Now by the time the imagine 24 hours gone, then you decide this is this is not really the anti-venom is uh, snake venom is playing. Maybe my patient is going into DIC. So that time we might not give, we may have to give supportive care for DIC, but that will be confirmed by the rest of the other tests and like blood picture and all, not only with this whole blood cut in time, but usually except Russell's, remember, this is the only thing I want to remember, except Russell's, rest of the snakes you give 10 vials, that is usually enough. Russell's, you start with 20 and you can repeat every six hours, but when you give for four, three, four, times, then you have to decide whether to continue or not, but that decision should be taken by your consultant. So you don't want to worry. So what we initially want my is my house officer, whether that house officer is capable of identifying whether this is a snake bite, whether this patient need antivenom or not. Once my house officer gives first dose, I can come and see the rest uh, in half an hour. So Remember this, do not continue AVS administration for persistent neurotoxicity, provided the coagulopathy has reversed, okay? So I told you the cobra and crate bride, usually one dose AVS is sufficient. So when we are giving antivenom, You have to observe your patient carefully for anaphylaxis because they usually get anaphylaxis. Um, and uh, you monitor pulse blood pressure, you know, usually patient is attached to the monitor. And the one thing you have remember, you can't give antivenom and go and have a tea. You have to sit with the patient for one hour, okay? And you have to keep the adrenaline available at the bedside. So observe for the rash, observe for the anaphylaxis. So you know the dose of adrenaline dose for the anaphylaxis. So you have to start keep that um, to give it in need, and then you followed by chlorpheniramine and hydrocortisone. So we will talk about a bit about the hump nose wiper. This is hump nose. I told you now he's a venomous one. Now they usually come with local swelling, and uh, even with systemic envenomation, we don't treat. So now I, I worry is this one I newly added. Now, this hump nose also, because it's a wiper, uh, wiper one, their whole blood clotting time may be increased. But we don't give antivenom. But when it is whole blood kind of positive, these they have identified in a certain study, these people will go into ARF soon. So these are the people we have to be very carefully, uh, give fluid resuscitation, giving fluids, managing that before they go into renal failure, okay? That is the only thing important in hump nose so when you do the whole blood clot, if it is positive, now this is a sign that your patient might go into renal failure. So you have to give some fluids, monitor the fluid, and then uh, anticipate now he might go into renal failure. So you know what uh, the problem with hump nose is they can get a local necrosis, uh, uh, not only the local signs, they can go into renal failure. But the uh, difference is wiper, Russell's wiper, when they come in within a few hours, they will go into acute renal failure. But for the hump nose, usually they go into the acute renal failure the next day or two. So they usually don't go into the ARF within the first five, six hours. So therefore, when a hump nose wiper comes, we don't discharge them. We keep them for 24 hours, sometimes for 48 hours, okay? while monitoring their renal function and out. Sea snakes, they get stiffness aching because they can have a muscle pain and myoglobin and things, but we will not, we don't have any antivenom for him. We will just observe. So acute renal failure, you can prevent by giving early AVS. That is why we identified 
ensure good urine output, adequate IV fluids, might give IV frusamide, and uh, ask patient to avoid whatever fruit juices or king coconut. And then uh, if you diagnose it, you don't wait and see whether this one is getting recovered immediately, we go for hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. So the respiratory failure is a major problem for loving create by Usually we have to intubate them. They, so initially you do the ambu ventilation until you find someone capable of doing ventilation, uh, intubation within few minutes. So these patients need respiratory because they will get better within two, three days on ventilator. So this is slide, this slide is for just to uh, show you the prevention, which is not actually for this thing. Okay, so the take home message is most importantly, you identify the snake and do the whole blood cutting time time, even for a pump nose wiper bite. And if, when you identify the venomous host snakes, you can go for antivenom soon. For the hump rustles, we go with 20, 20 wires. Uh, rest of the snakes, we go with 10 wires. So usually they are, uh, 10 wires are enough for other, uh, other snakes, except for the Russells. Every six hours, you do whole blood coating time and continue your antivenom for Russells. When it comes to 24 hours or oh, a bit more, so if you think this might be not antivenom, uh, it is DIC, so we'll investigate to DIC. And hump nose, if the whole blood coating time is positive, you have to be very careful of the patient. We are sure that my patient might go into the acute renal failure and carefully monitor the patient and support you care. Even without increased whole blood coating time, you have to be carefully manage that patient. Rest of the snakes, tarantula, whatever things, um, anyone, it, you just need to observe your patient. Even sometimes centipede bite comes, they have not seen the centipede. We just do the whole blood coating time and keep them for 24 hours observation and then, then you send the patient, okay? Um, thank you. If any questions, I'm happy to answer. I have a few, I think it's three minutes left for the questions. Right. Uh, thank you, madam, for that. Uh... Very interesting lecture. So, if you all have any questions, please ask, unmute and ask. We have one or two minutes for to answer questions. I think they don't have questions. It's the instant it, Prashant. I think maybe they're waiting for the snake to bite. <laughs> and now only thing even the in her, I am in this Piliandal area no? we never yes. seen we are now seeing Rasta Swipers oh really yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, not only the Kurunagal and Kantale now it's, it's because of this uh, sand transport madam. You were not sand transport is the uh, the so uh, scaled yeah. but the Russell Swipers are available at Horana Polga Soviet and oh, okay. they have some uh, bit of a um, forest the, kind the, of thing they have yeah, the, yeah. Bushes. Bushes, yes. Okay, then. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, for that interesting lecture. Uh, Dr. Pima Jaisa, a senior lecturer at KD. Thank you. So, uh, we'll go to the next lecture by uh, Dilusha Lama Badasuria, consultant physician. To uh, check pain. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Okay, I hope you can uh, see and hear me all right. Okay, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Lama Surya, and I've been given the task of talking to you about how to approach a patient with chest pain as an intern medical officer. Um, slide. So this is something, uh, unfortunately you have to, or fortunately you have to know inside out and to be very thorough with. 
because it is one of the commonest presentations that you will come across. So any medical casualty, uh, you will be having at least five, six patients coming with chest pain. And also it can occur, I mean, if a patient say gets admitted with a, a fever, they can develop chest pain while on the ward. So it's not something you can get away not knowing. You have to know this inside out and be thorough with it. Um, so chest pain, there are so many causes for it. There is a varied list of differentials. And amongst these causes, you know that even there are minor ailments like a, rib, a muscle sprain or a muscle tear can give rise to chest pain. But also among these causes, multitude of causes, there are life-threatening causes. So your role as an intern when wading through all these patients with chest pain is perhaps the most important role is to identify these life-threatening causes because when you identify them early, you can treat them early and make a significant impact for that patient's outcome. So at, at the start of this lecture, I want to take you through these life-threatening causes so that they are stuck in your mind. And whenever you approach a patient with chest pain, you run through them, make sure this patient is not having any one of these. So you can use the 4 to one rule to remember these more easily. There are four reasons, arise causes arising from the heart, so the acute coronary syndromes, aortic dissection, uh, pericarditis with or without myocarditis and uh, pericardial effusions, which may be tamponading or not. Then there are two, two causes arising from the lung, which is the pulmonary embolism and a tension pneumothorax. And then one cause uh, from the other mediastinal structure, which is a esophageal perforation. So all of these are life-threatening, needs early identification and early treatment. So among, apart from these, there are so many other causes of chest pain. Um, so from uh, uh, rising from the skin, like in herpes zoster, or the skeletal structures where there's either rib fracture or costochondritis, or from the muscle where there's a sprain, or even the, all the upper abdominal organs can give rise to chest pain, be it the gallbladder, pancreas, uh, the subdiaphragmatic area, if there's a collection or abscess there, um, and even uh, gastric ulcers, GORD, things like that. So in order to identify um, what, are the, what, what is the cause of the chest pain, how to uh, prioritize your differential diagnosis, you need to do a, have a systematic approach to the patient and have a quick but comprehensive system of how you assess the patient. So if the patient is looking ill, um, you would straight away switch to the A, B, C, D, E approach, where you know this already. I think this, this has been reiterated several times over. So the airway breathes, so I won't go into much detail. So airway breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Each of these steps are very important, and you must not miss any of them. You may think exposure is not so important in a patient with chest pain, but it could be because you may be missing a herpes zoster rash. You may think doing a quick disability check is not important, but a sugar, checking a sugar, checking, making sure he's not had any acute neurological symptoms is, is equally important. I will explain why later on. So don't miss out on any of the steps. If the patient is looking ill with chest pain, do a quick A, B, C, D, E assessment. But if the patient is uh, looking somewhat stable, you can then move on to the a more detailed history examination and finish up by planning your investigations along with your management. So in the history, I mean, you know all this, there are certain key questions you have to ask each and every patient about the nature of the chest pain, uh, be the site, how, what's the nature of it, uh, does it radiate, how did it come about, the onset, sudden or gradual, the duration, how severe it is, and of course the precipitants, relieving factors and associated factors. So when we take each course, I will go into it in more detail. But something that I use with my patients and I find quite useful upfront is to ask them to show me where the chest pain is. So how they show it and where they show it kind of gives you a lot of clues. So if the patient takes a finger and kind of pinpoints a certain area of your chest, uh, that makes it very unlikely to be ischemic because ischemic pains, what they usually do is they take their whole hand 
and grip the front of the chest. It's a diffuse pain. So uh, a good um, kind of starting point is to ask your patient to show you how the, where the chest pain is. And you can um, quickly make uh, some inferences by how they show it and where, where they show it. Uh, so uh, you have to go through all this uh, list of questions to evaluate the pain. But keep in mind that patients are not uh, from textbooks and they don't always keep in with typical presentations. So uh, these groups of patients, they may not have the typical chest pain history of a ischemic chest pain, especially females. Uh, they may come out with very varied descriptions of the chest pain. And then the elderly, they may not have chest pain at all. They may be confused, but they are having an acute myocardial infarction. So presentations could be atypical. Uh, inferior MIs can present as epigastric pain, even posterior MIs. And diabetics, as you know, may not have pain at all. So despite, I mean, common things fitting into a certain pattern, there are certain atypical presentations in certain patient groups. So like I mentioned, if you, if you ask a patient to show pain in, uh, in the case of a cardiac ischemia, this is how they usually show it. And uh, the probability of cardiac ischemia is higher when, they, when the pain is central and they often describe it as a heaviness or pressure or discomfort um, that is in the central or retrosternal area. And if it's becoming more localized or sharper pain, that makes the probability of ischemia low. But there is no hard and fast rule. You can't completely rule out ischemia just because the pain is sharp or positional. So uh, this is just the generalization that we do. So the other features generally of cardiac ischemia is that the pain is gradual onset. It's quite severe, can be brought on by stress, even emotional stress, uh, some kind of exertion. It can radiate to the arm and jaw. Uh, and there are a lot of autonomic features, nausea, vomiting, sweating. And uh, usually the physical examination is normal unless, of course, the complications such as acute pulmonary edema have set in. Um, while the chest pain with pericarditis tends to be a sharper pain, uh, it's, it radiates to the back and is relieved by bending forwards, and it can increase with the respiratory movements. And uh, when you ask a quick history, they, they, they could have had an MI a few weeks ago, and this could be like a dressless syndrome, or they could have had fever, it could be. So there's some associated trigger you, maybe you could find in the history where there's like a viral pericarditis. And again, the physical examination can be completely normal, uh, but some, in some cases, you may be able to feel and hear a pericardial rub. So another uh, uh, life-threatening cause we, we listed above is aortic dissection. This may not be common. You may not ever see it, but it's something you must always consider. Um, so this is a sudden severe pain. Uh, it's quite like a tearing pain that radiates to the back and uh, usually it's of sudden onset. So here you may find some physical examination findings. So uh, this is why I would recommend for any patient who comes with chest pain that as an intern that you always check all the pulses, peripheral pulses, and always check the blood pressure in both arms. Because in the case of aortic dissection, you can get a radioradial or radiofemoral delay and you may get a significant difference in the blood pressure when you measure it between your right and the left arms. By significant, I mean more than 20 millimoles of mercury. So uh, I think it's good practice as an intern in any patient with chest pain to do this. Check the pulses, radio, radio, radio femoral, and check the blood pressure in both arms. So if there is associated, uh, the aortic valve is involved and there's aortic regurgitation, you may hear the early diastolic murmur of AR, but this can be easily missed. But things like the pulse and blood pressure, you will definitely detect. And if the, then the carotid arteries are involved, they may have neurological symptoms as well. So that's, and signs as well. So that's why the D section of the ABCD is important in the evaluation of chest pain. Um, so pneumonia can also cause chest pain, but that is the pain is more lateral. It increases with respiration and usually they have uh, fever, cough, dyspnea, and of course, when you examine the patient, there are a lot of lung signs. 
like a rub or percussion note is dull, you can have crepitations, bronchial breathing, etc. So in the case of a pulmonary embolism, once again, the chest pain tends to be pleuritic in nature and the patients are quite short of breath and uh, they are hypoxic. And this uh, dyspnea and hypoxia is quite in, uh, uh, not related to the lung signs, usually disproportionate to the lung signs. Usually you don't hear much lung signs or you don't hear any, but the patient is in significant respiratory distress. Patients is, has significant hypoxia. So in that kind of situation, if they're having pleuritic chest pain as well, you have to think an alarm bell should ring whether this could be pulmonary embolism. Um, so, and the other one uh, that we have to be aware of is the tension pneumothorax, where again the patient may have a sharp pleuritic type of chest pain. They are dyspneic, they can be hypoxic. And the physical examination is crucial, where you find reduced air entry, a hyperresonant percussion note. So a good cardiovascular examination and a good respiratory examination is crucial in any patient coming with chest pain. Uh, in the case of a esophageal uh, rupture or esophageal spasm, so esophageal spasm is where the esophagus can go into spasms and this kind of pain is very similar to ischemic chest pain and very hard to differentiate clinically. They too will have retrosternal pain, they have it's tightening in nature, they can have sweating, vomiting, so quite often we had to rely on the ECG and the cardiac biomarkers to differentiate the two. Uh, the esophageal rupture usually occurs following a procedure of some kind, like an endoscopy procedure or a bout of violent retching or a recurrent vomiting where the esophagus perforates and they get mediastinitis and there can be acute chest pain. So apart from these uh, main and major causes, don't forget the uh, upper abdominal organs, which can cause such significant chest pain, like the acute pancreatitis or the polycystitis, and of course, the, the musculoskeletal causes and the causes arising from the skin, like zoster. So once you have uh, done your history, once you have done your examination of the patient, uh, you have to proceed with your plan and plan your investigations. So however, uh, typical or atypical the chest pain is, whether it's an 18-year-old or whether it's a 55-year-old coming with chest pain, I think in all your patients, an ECG is a must. And that ECG should be done within 10 minutes of you meeting the patient, of the patient coming into hospital and meeting his first contact doctor. Because as you know, time is crucial in certain conditions uh, causing the chest pain. So if it is a ST elevation MI, you know that time is muscle. Every minute that's delayed, there's less uh, blood flow to the cardiac muscle and there's depth of the muscle. So any patient, however atypical the pain is, however young or old, get an ECG done within the first 10 minutes and you have to see that ECG. It should not be, you can't order it and it can't be left in some BHT and you see it one hour later. You have to see it yourself and make sure that there are no acute changes on it. So this is a must. And say uh, you do the ECG, but the ECG looks normal. But the patient is still having very significant cardiac sounding, ischemic sounding chest pain. So don't just say, rule out uh, that this is not cardiac ischemia, this is some other cause and just leave it at that. Always repeat the ECG because the changes take time. The changes may be dynamic. So always, even if the ECG looks normal, do serial ECGs to make sure it remains normal. And it would be helpful to find prior ECGs, old ECGs of the patient to compare with, to look for dynamic changes, to see if there are, if there was, say, example, and they had left bundle branch block, whether that is new onset and, or an old one. So an ECG is not useful just for diagnosing a uh, acute coronary syndrome, you know it is useful for other conditions as well. So in the case of a pulmonary embolism, the commonest change you would see is a sinus tachycardia. And the typically described S1, Q3, T3 is not commonly seen and neither is it specific or sensitive, but certainly if you see it, that means a S wave in, in lead one and a Q wave in lead three and an inverted T in lead three. But if you see that, it is suggestive of an embolism, certainly. And then you can see uh, features of right heart strain, which are the anterior T-verb inversions in leads V1 to V3 
You can see right axis deviation or a new right bundle branch block, and even atrial fibrillation can occur in pulmonary embolism. So uh, in the case of pericarditis, uh, there are signif certain uh, significant changes. You can see a PR segment depression and ST elevations. In this case, the ST elevations are saddle shaped and they are diffuse. They don't really involve certain territory of the heart, like say anterior distribution or inferior distribution. They are diffuse changes. And um, in the case of uh, if they de if develop a pericardial effusion and tamponade, you can see low voltage complexes or electrical alternance. And aortic dissection, the ECG could be normal, but if the coronary arteries are getting involved, you can see the ischemic changes. So ECG is important, not just for acute coronary syndrome. So along with the ECG, if this is a ischemic sign during chest pain, you would arrange a troponin eye, a high sensitive troponin eye. Make sure you adequately time it because depending on uh, what your lab, when you go to work, uh, get to know uh, which kind of high sensitive troponin they do and what time uh, it takes to start rising in wherever you start working. So you make sure you adequately time it. And uh, if, if it's negative, uh, after adequately time is still the pain is suggesting you might want to repeat it. And always keep in mind, just the positive troponin 9 just does not mean a myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome. There are so many other causes for troponin 9 to go up. And even if it's a myocardial infarction, there are different types like type 1 and type 2. You know, type 1 myocardial infarctions are actually the ones due to an unstable plaque or a ruptured plaque with occlusion, while the type 2 ones um, are not due to a plaque rupture and they, they are not treated the same way. They are due to actually the increased demand for the coronary uh, blood flow. So things like anemia or sepsis, where you don't treat it with the traditional antiplatelet thrombolysis, you treat it by treating the underlying cause. So what I'm trying to say is don't just take an isolated troponin value and if it's high diagnosis as a uh, ACS type 1 MI and treat it as such, you have to take it in the whole context of the patient, the history, the examination, the ECG findings. So uh, don't treat it in isolation. So if it is a cardiac sounding chest pain, you do the ECG, you do the troponin, they are both suggestive, the lungs are clear, perhaps you wouldn't think of getting a chest X-ray. But in other cases where the chest pain is not very typical, uh, you're waiting for the troponin to come back, you're hearing some lung signs or any other kind of atypical kind of chest pain, you will consider X-ray because that is also quite important to, and gives clues to your diagnosis. So in aortic dissection, actually 90% of patients with aortic dissection will have some kind of chest X-ray abnormality, like a widened media spinner or uh, the aortic knob will be uh, distorted. So I'll just move this here. You can see the this is a portable and supine X-ray, but still the various thinum looks wide. And uh, in this case, there is the, the contour of the aortic knuckle is a bit distorted. So the X-ray is useful in those cases. Um, and they say more than 90% of patients with uh, aortic dissection will have some X-ray change. So chest X-ray is useful, obviously in pneumonias, in pleural effusions, diagnosing a pericardial tamponade. So you can see in this picture, that there's a large globular-shaped heart. This is suggestive that there is an effusion. So if you see X-ray like this, you will speak to your senior and try to arrange an urgent echo to see if they confirm the effusion, see if there's any tamponade. Uh, so this is X-ray of a pneumothorax with a collapsed lung, uh, narrow mediastinum. Again, a pneumothorax, you can see the lung line here with reduced uh, lung markings. Um, so the chest X-ray might surprise you. So if it's a kind of chest pain, you're not quite sure what the diagnosis is. You do X-ray and you suddenly see this, an air under the diaphragm. Um, so uh, we, may, we may pick up something that we are missing just by doing a simple investigation like a chest X-ray. And here it's an X-ray of a patient with a usopageal rupture. You can see there's free air here along the line of the usipagus and some subcutaneous emphysema as well. So another test that uh, comes up associated with chest pain is a D-dimer. Um, these are not really available in most hospitals, but uh, you, you may be uh, uh, asked to do them or uh, think of ordering it, but know how to and when to use it. 
So D dimers are certainly useful, but they're useful when they're used properly. Uh, you know that it's a test you use in pulmonary embolism, but you should use it only after doing a risk certification. So you suspect a patient is having a PE and you do a risk score, like the Bell's or the Perk score, to see if how at what risk this patient is of having a PE. So if the patient is of high risk, you wouldn't do a D-dimer. You would straight away go for a more definitive test. If the patient is of low risk test probability only, you would do a D-dimer. And even then, a negative D-dimer is, you can definitely say, okay, this patient is not having a PE. But a high D-dimer does not diagnose a PE. You have to do a more definitive test. So D-dimers are, again, like troponins, a lot of causes were arise in D-dimer, including normal pregnancy, including sepsis. So you need to know how to use it, when to use it, and how to interpret it. So other tests that you might consider is the full blood count, arterial blood gas, and then the uh, liver functions and the serum amylase if you're thinking of pancreatitis. So um, I'd like, to, so once you do those investigations, you would what identify the cause and start your definitive management. Um, so let me take you through a few cases uh, to kind of summarize what we were talking about. So this is a 55-year-old man who presents to the medical casualty with the severe central chest pain that's tightening in nature. It started an hour ago and he's sweating profusely. You examine him, his heart rate is 92. You're a good house officer, so you check his blood pressure in both arms and pulses in both arms. They're all equal. Lungs are clear. His saturation is fine. And you arrange an urgent ECG within that 10 minutes. And this is what you see. You see uh, uh, ST elevation, significant ST elevations in all of his chest leads, widespread or in all of his chest leads. So as an intern, what should you do? Uh, immediately get him into a HDU bed. You attach the cardiac monitor uh, and you give him, because he's in pain, you give him the pain relief and the antiemetic. And uh, you're reasonably confident that this is a type 1 MI. This is a 52-year-old man, no comorbidities. He doesn't look pale. Um, and uh, you've done the blood pressure checks. So you would think that this is very likely to be a acute ST elevation MI, type 1 MI. You load him with aspirin, clopid, and the statin. So these things you can do as a house officer without any senior concurrence because these kind of these things are urgent. Along with this, you can inform your senior because now this patient has come within one hour of getting the chest pain. So the possibility of a primary uh, percutaneous intervention is possible. He's within that two-hour window. So you contact your senior immediately, see if it's if this is feasible at, or at all, whether it's available in your center or whether he can be transferred to a center that it is available. If not, you will go ahead with the thrombolysis. So I won't go into detail about the management of acute MI. I just wanted you to know the, how to assess uh, the, more, more on the approach to chest pain and how to do the immediate management. So uh, then this is a 32-year-old male. This is a different patient who comes to your medical casualty with burning pain and uh, kind of pain in the epigastric region. Again, one hour duration. He has been drinking with his friends the night before and the pain came on a few hours afterwards in the middle of the night. He's also sweaty. His heart rate is 92 and his blood pressure is fine. His lungs are clear and he's has got good saturation. You examine his abdomen, it's a bit tender, but there's no guarding or rigidity. So you think he's 32, he's been drinking, he has epigastric pain. So this is likely some kind of GORD or pancreatitis. So you just send his bloods for um, full blood count, amylase, and liver functions. You start him on um, PPI. You do a chest x-ray that looks normal too. But what have you missed? You have missed this ECG. And this is what it shows. So there are inferior ST elevations in the reads two, three, AVF. So I put this case because no matter what age, so he's 32, you think he's unlikely to have a myocardial infarction. And no matter what presentation, it's a burning type pain, it's epigastric. It's not suggestive of cardiac ischemia. But no matter what the presentation is, always do a ECG because you can't afford to miss this because it makes a big impact on the patient. 
So this is another patient. He is a 75-year-old man. He comes with, again, a central severe chest pain that's been there for an hour, and he's sweating profusely. He's got a heart rate of 92, and because you're a good officer, you checked his blood pressure in both arms, there is a significant difference you've noted. There's a 20 millimeter mercury difference, low, less blood pressure in his left arm. Uh, his lungs are also clear, his saturation is 96. So you do an urgent ECG, and the ECG shows ST elevations in 2 3 area. So if you didn't do this blood pressure check, you would treat this patient exactly like, like what you would, how you would treat the patient in case one. You would get, give him antiplatelets and you would think of thrombolizing him or sending him for PCI. But because you checked his blood pressure in both arms and you noticed that difference, you think there may be something else going on. So you tell your senior and you order a chest x-ray and the chest x-ray you think the mediastinum looks wide. So you along with your senior arrange an urgent bedside echo and that's showing a bit of aortic regurgitation and a thin rim of pericardial effusion. So this patient is actually having an aortic dissection that has involved the coronaries and that has given rise to ST elevations as well. So you then arrange for a CT aortogram to diagnose and uh, manage this patient appropriately. So in this case, if you didn't do this blood pressure check, think of this and load it here. That would actually be the more detrimental So simple thing to do, make a difference. In case, a 45-year-old patient, he has severe throbbing pain on the right side of his chest for about four hours. Um, his vitals are stable, but he continues to be in severe pain. So other examination was normal and you order urgent ECG. And the ECG looks normal. Uh, but you hadn't examined the patient properly. So when you go back, he's still having pain. You lift his shirt up and have a look properly. That should have a rash on the back of his chest. And this is the rash of herpes zoster. And quite uh, commonly give rise to severe chest pains. So always you examine your patients properly. Uh, uh, even if they come with a chest pain, they need a good thorough examination. So I'd like to finish uh, my uh, talk uh, by leaving you with these uh, few take-home messages. So your, your role as an intern working in medical wards, evaluating chest pain is vital. If you're, you have a very, very important role and it's crucial. You're the first contact doctor with the patients and your actions and what, what you do will make a big impact, big change to the patient. So always keep those life-threatening causes in mind, however rare, However uncommon they may be, keep them in mind and exclude them when you're evaluating the patient. Do a quick but comprehensive evaluation and make sure the ECG is done within 10 minutes, whatever the pain, whatever the age of the patient, and that you see that ECG, not that it's tucked away in a BHT and you see it an hour later. And if you have any doubt, so you don't know how to interpret the ECG, it looks odd, but you don't know what it is or there's something uh, that you can't quite figure out about the patient, always you have the luxury of having seniors, the SHOs, the trainees, the consultants, so always involve your seniors if you have any doubt. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Um, like if there is enough time, I can take some questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much then. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. So uh, I think we are going to take a tea break now. So, um, yeah. So let's...
ten thirty we start at eleven o'clock. No. So we started eleven o'clock uh, with ECG interpretations so by Professor Nama, which is in a short tea break now. Thank you.